Welcome, Dr. Bax, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Lorena Telles. I work at LaCardio, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you to our moderator for this event. Dr. Juan Hernando El Portillo, interventional cardiologist of LaCardio. Welcome, and thank you for being with us. Okay, I'm just um, being sure. Gracias, Lorena. Eh, buenas tardes, y muchas gracias a todos por su participación. Mi nombre es Juan Hernando El Portillo, y los estaré acompañando en la moderación de esta conferencia. Les recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia autoriza el tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales serán tratados de acuerdo a la ley 1581 de 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales, la cual pueden consultar en www.cardinfantil.org. De igual forma, le informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada. El chat de preguntas se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes les agradecemos dejar allí sus inquietudes, las cuales resolveremos al final de la sesión. Hoy tenemos el honor de contar con la participación como expositor del doctor Jerome Bax con la conferencia New Perspectives in the Management of Moderate Aortic Stenosis. I'm delighted and it's an honor for me to present Dr. Jerome Bax. He studied in medical school at Leiden University Medical Center. His cardiology training was at Leiden University Medical Center and a PhD from the Free University in Amsterdam. Dr. Jerome Bax is Director of Non-Invasive Car Imaging and Director of Ecolab at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. His main interests include clinical cardiology, heart valve disease, heart failure, cardiac resynchronization therapy, and applying all different imaging modalities to these clinical fields. Professor Bax has authored over 1,700 papers, holds several positions in national and international scientific organizations, and serves on the editorial boards of many different journals. He is the immediate past president of the European Society of Cardiology. Dr. Bax, welcome and thank you so much for being here with us, and we look forward to your lecture. You may start. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with you. Although we cannot uh, see each other live, it's still good to do it this way. And uh, I, I really want to thank you for this opportunity. So um, we're going to speak about 45 minutes. And what I've done is I brought both the mitral valve in and the aortic valve. So this thing, what I'm going to start with is this, this big, you know, endless discussion about how do we select. And I'm just going to show you my view, why I think that, um, yeah, what my view is on this. And then we switch to the moderate aortic stenosis, uh, and then we do the discussion. So I think I'm going to take about, let's say, some 40 minutes or so for the talk, and then we, um, we discuss. Is that more or less what you had in mind? Yes, could be uh, the possibility. Yes, it is perfect for us. Okay. No problem. Yeah, no, I think this, this is good because it's all about constantly like what, what to do in these heart valves. And um, so I'm going to start with this. I think for me in, in uh, transcatheter heart valve disease, this is the most intriguing part because nobody really knows um, yeah, what to do and what not to do. So I'm going to put a little bit of time here that I know how long we're doing. So how to select patients for mitral clip in functional MR. And I think if we talk about it, we need to first speak a little bit about the geometry of the valve. So mitral valve geometry is, is not that complex. A lot of people nowadays make it more and more complex and 3D imaging is very good, but they're basically very simple things that you need to keep in mind. I'm going to take a pointer that you can see. This one you should be able to see. So if we talk about mitral valve geometry, there's two things that are important, first of all. The first thing is the coaptation length. What does that mean? That means in the native heart is the part where these leaflets, the tips of the leaflets, still connect. So it's, it's basically this. You like to have a little bit more of this, but when you develop heart failure, it becomes more of this, that they just touch because the ventricle is getting bigger and bigger. And then we got this other part and that's the coaptation depth. 
And that is how far these tips of the leaflets are retracted into the ventricle. And so people put numbers there because they like to see numbers. So the first one is coaptation depth should not be more than 11 millimeters. It should not be too far retracted here because then it's not treatable anymore. I think a number of 11 doesn't make sense. Uh, it could have also been 12, it could have also been 10. It's just what you as a clinician see. What happens in these failing hearts is that these hearts dilate and with that you get the retraction into the ventricle. And that is this coaptation depth. Here you see it much more clearly indicated, right? So it's here you have the ventricle. It's a transesophageal view. And you see that all of these leaflets are completely retracted into the ventricle because the ventricle is not only dilating this way, but also that way. As a result, you retract it into the ventricle. So the coaptation depth should not be too far into the ventricle, I would say. Um, if I go to the next one, you need also have some coaptation length. What does that mean? This one here doesn't have any coaptation length. You see that here? And this gives a massive regurgitation. But also when you take a short axis, you see that it uh, simply doesn't touch each other anymore. So you need to have to start some touching, some coaptation length. It's, it's a little bit like this, but it should not be absolutely nothing. These are the leaflet geometries that you need to think about. Other things that we need to think about is difficult situations. This one is a cleft. You can very clearly see this on this nice 3D image. One, two, and the cleft. And you see here in the still frame that very clearly that these are difficult cases for implantation. So it's not just what I showed before about the coaptation, but it's also difficult anatomy. And then you don't want to have too much calcium. Here you see a lot of calcium in that valve. We can see it on this simple transverse of a geal view. And we can also see that on the um, 3D views. So we don't want too much calcium in the grasping areas because why not? We take the risk of breaking uh, parts of the valve when you come and we start clipping. And then of course, because we're not only doing transcatheter um, clips, but we're also starting to think more and more about transcatheter mitral valve replacement. And you don't want too much calcium. If there's a lot of calcium in this annulus, that is basically not very good. So severe mitral annular calcifications is not the good substrate. So here you got a couple of contraindications, not complete contraindications, but at least things that say you need a different anatomy than that. So leaflet anatomy, we spoke about this clefts, but there's also more complex ones. We spoke about calcification in the grasping areas, and we speak about severe mitral annular calcification. Now, what you see here is the first pictures were echoes. And now you actually start to see a CT scan. And that's the point I wanna make next is that if you work in the field of imaging and you work in the transcatheter space, which is becoming more and more and more popular, then you need to know not only echo, you need to master 2D echo, transesophageal echo and 3D echo, but you also need to have some knowledge about CT because a lot of these device procedures are upfront evaluated with CT. This is one example that I gave you about this calcium. We can see it on echo, but it's so much easier to see that on CT scan. So us as imaging cardiologists, if we wanna really work in this space, you need to have knowledge about echo, all the different forms, but also about CT scan. CT scan will be used not only for the coronaries, as you see here, we can depict very easily the coronary, right coronary artery, but also the valve, the aortic and mitral as indicated here. So that is something where I see the field changing. We used to work with echo mostly, but now we're shifting uh, to some part to CT or not we're shifting, but we start to work more and more with that. Other things that you don't want, you don't want a mitral valve stenosis. That's not shown here, but what is shown is ASD and PFOs. And also you do not want to have pulmonary hypertension because actually then eventually you leave a shunt after you've done 
uh, your device, and that is not good either. Okay, then comes the discussion. What are the patients? What is the best patient? So first let's talk about this risk assessment. So these are the patients with a low risk. These are the patients that have a relatively okay outcome after the treatment, or sorry, uh, without any treatment. They have a low risk, good outcome without any treatment. These are the patients with a high risk. And these are the most difficult ones. These are in the middle. So we're, we're moving towards, we spoke about anatomical things that we need to know, or we need to include or exclude for treating. But we also need to think about who needs it. Well, I'm gonna put it very simple. These patients have a relatively small leaking hole, right? There is less mitral regurgitation and therefore they have a better survival. If we now take the ones at higher risk, let me just move this over here a little bit. If we take the ones at higher risk, these have a much bigger leaking hole, therefore worse MR, therefore worse survival. The difficulty is in here. What do we do with these patients? So if you look, we got two sorts. This one, the most of the volume of the blood is leaving through the aorta, out of the ventricle, so the right way to say, the forward stroke volume. And there is some MR, but it isn't that bad. This one here has not so much going forward, but has a lot of it going backward. So these are the patients that are also at higher risk. These are intermediate lower risk. These are intermediate higher risk. What do you take from this, what I'm saying here? <clears throat> I'm telling you that it is an interplay between what your ventricular function is and how much leaking blood you have. If we look at the outcomes, this is the leaking hole, the effective regurgitant orifice area, and this is the amount of blood that's leaking. And you see here that if you have a smaller leaking hole, the outcome is relatively good as when you have a big leaking hole and the outcome is not good. That's the first point. Then here you see the regurgitant volume, the leaking amount of blood. If it is not so much as we saw in the previous picture, then the outcome is good. But if there's a lot of blood leaking, then the outcome is not good. Bigger leaking area, worse mitral regurgitation, worse survival leaking area, I just call that effective regurgitant orifice area. More leaking blood, bigger regurgitant volume, worse MR, worse survival. That's basically how it works. Now, then came these two trials. The one trial shows here, the mitral affair, the French one, that the intervention in red and the control in blue had exactly the same outcomes. There was no difference at all in their outcomes. And then we had this other one, which was completely opposite. Here you see that the device in blue has a better outcome than the ones that were treated only with medication. This is the patients dying. So here more patients are dying. Here less patients are dying. So we got two complete different situations. And then I'm gonna take you here and I'm gonna give you these two examples that in my opinion, tell you a lot. I'm gonna move this over still a little bit here, maybe. So like this. So this is a 70 year old man, 79 year old man, ischemic cardiomyopathy, admitted with acute heart failure three times in the last year. He has a high cholesterol. He's an ex-smoker, has kidney failure. He has three vessel disease. He cannot be revascularized. His ECG shows atrial fibrillation as many of these patients have. The medication is shown here, analapril, furosemide, metoprolol, dabigatran, and atorvastatin. And the first question that you will say is, okay, he doesn't have by far not maximum medication. 
but a lot of these patients have low blood pressure, et cetera, and they don't tolerate a lot of medication. This is an MRI. You can see that he has a big infarct there. And when we look at this echo, we see that the right ventricle is relatively okay. The atria are big, big atria. And this shows this area of infarction, as you can see here. And when we look at the color-coded pictures, you see massive regurgitation. Now we're going to look at the volumes of this heart. First, we start with the LVEDD. This is the left ventricular end diastolic diameter. And we see that the LVEDD, 60 millimeters. The LV end diastolic volume is 170. The end systolic volume is 115. And the ejection fraction is 32. The leaking hole that we just discussed effective regurgent orifice area is pretty large. We also have significant amount of blood leaking, what you're seeing here. So you could say that this is probably more of a valvular disease and less of a ventricular disease. Let's see what happens. So we treated this patient with two microclips. He was then in New York class one, no more admissions, real success story, Heart failure medication adjusted downscaled, as you see there, is LVEDD 60, the volumes more or less the same, ejection fractions 28. Now I take this other one. And if you see these two contrasting ones, you start to see the picture. So this is a 74-year-old male, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. In 1995, ventricular tachycardia gets an ICD. In 1999, chronic atrial fibrillation. And in 2000, husband, his bundle ablation and CRTD. New York class four. This is the medication. Amiodarone, digoxin, dimutinide, losartan, and warfarin. This is a huge ventricle. And you see the ventricle is exactly what we talked about in the beginning. You see that? These leaflets are completely retracted into the ventricle and they're just touching each other. See the right side? It's not as good as the previous one. There's the device. HR also big, but this is a huge ventricle. So this looks more like a ventricular disease primarily. And when you see that mitral regurgitation, it's less than the previous one. Now let's take a look at these numbers here. This left ventricular end diastolic dimension is 80 millimeters, whereas the other was 60 millimeters. So this is a very big ventricle. The end diastolic volume is 500, huge. The end systolic volume is 400 and the ejection fraction is very low. But now let's do a look at this here. And that's why I put it in red. The effective regurgitant orifice area is 19 and the regurgitant volume is 23. This is much smaller than the other one. This is more of a ventricular problem and not so much a valvular problem. This is what we did. Mitro clip, he stayed in New York four. He died at nine months after. We do routinely all these follow-ups. So we got a six months echo here for you. LVEDD was 80. LVEDV was 450. And LVESV is now 400. It's exactly the same as where we started. And it is a very bad situation. And you see that the ejection fraction went down. This is one point to just talk about two minutes. Why is this ejection fraction going down? It's not that this ejection fraction is going down, but the mitral regurgitation has disappeared. So his ejection fraction, what we saw before, was consisting of the blood that went through the aorta plus the one that was leaking backwards. Now this ventricle is now no longer leaking backwards. So he needs to pump extra blood through there and he cannot do that. So LVEF of 11% was more or less what it was before we started the procedure. Because we closed the back door, he cannot unload anymore. And now you really see how bad that ventricle is. I've given you two very extreme situations just to get a feeling of what we are talking about. So why are these two patients different? This is the success patient. This is the failure patient. Success patient had much smaller end diastolic dimension, much smaller volumes, and a little bit higher ejection fraction. This one, 
had a much larger ventricle, LVEDD 80 versus 60, and huge volumes. This EF is really inflated because once you close it, you see how bad that ventricle is. This one, effective regurgit orifice area, so the leaking hole is much bigger than this one, 37 versus 19. The regurgitant volume is much bigger than this one. So my point is, this is a smaller left ventricle with a larger mitral regurgitation. So this is more of a valvular disease, whereas this one is a huge ventricle that is not functioning with a very relatively small mitral regurgitation. So this is a ventricular disease. And the idea that starts to grow is that we need to learn when it is much more a valvular disease, then the clipping is doing really well and the outcomes are good because we can clip everything. I showed you here, almost everything. I showed you here that in terms of success story of taking away the mitral regurgitation was really good, but the patient didn't tolerate because that ventricle is completely damaged. So this is a large LV with a small MR. I've given you on purpose two extreme different ones so that it resonates with you what we're talking about. Again, valvular disease, ventricular disease. No good response, yes, good response. Mitral valve disease, LV disease. This is not new what we're talking about because this is the work that I did years ago with uh, our surgeons. And we looked at surgical secondary mitral regurgitation repair. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, as you see here, the patient. Also, again, that tenting, you see the retraction into the ventricle. Here is the mitral regurgitation on this MRI. Not a good ventricle. And we saw that if the LVEDD was less than 65 millimeters, that predicted pretty nicely that the patient was going to reverse remodel and do reasonably well. When that LVEDD was more than 65 or equal to 65, we found recurrent mitral regurgitation. We did a surgical repair, but the ventricle kept on dilating, mitral regurgitation came back, and eventually the patient died. Now, if you now use a cutoff of 65 or 60, that doesn't really matter. The point that we're making if once that ventricle is too dilated and it becomes really a ventricular disease, then also the surgery didn't help because we could repair it surgically. Surgical story was a success story, but later on the ventricle started to dilate and dilate again and the ventricle became that big that actually the mitral regurg came back. So what is the concept then that we're talking about? Well, we spoke about smaller ventricle, more mitral regurgitation. If we now look, and that's why I like this, this picture actually, this is the LVN diastolic volume. So the size of the heart, the bigger the heart. And this is the effective regurgitated orifice area here, the leaking hole, okay? So now we look at the mitral FR. They have a very big heart, like what we saw in the failure patient also. And they have less leaking hole. So that means that there is less mitral regurgitation. This is more a ventricular disease. Whereas the coapt, these patients have a much smaller LV and diastolic volume. So they're smaller hearts and they have much bigger leaking hole which much more mitral regurgitation. And that's the difference between these two trials. And it is hard to say exactly what are the cutoffs and which patients should we do and which patients shouldn't we do. But I showed you that technically, you can get a success in most of the patients. We want to treat patients symptomatic, that they feel better, but we also want to do something on survival. So finding the right patients for this job is something that we're searching for. And I have the feeling, and that's what most people say at the moment, is that once it's more a ventricular disease, you can treat what you want, but the ventricle is the problem, and that will fail. Once it's more a mitral valve disease, it's very good clippable. And you will usually see a reasonably good success with also a better outcome. Now I plotted it here like this. So this here is the mild to moderate dysfunction with an EF more than 20. I put extreme numbers according to co-op basically, LVF more than 20 and a smaller heart. 
This is the ones with really bad function with a low EF and a big heart. This is moderate to severe MR, so significant mitral regurgitation, and this is not so much. This is where the co-ops are, smaller left ventricle, better function with more mitral regurgitation. And this is where the mitral FR is. Huge ventricles, bad function, and not so much MR. And basically, you are probably too late in the disease. You can give maybe some symptomatic relief, but you're not going to prolong the survival. I'm going to stop here on that. Now we're going to switch to the other part, the moderate aortic stenosis. Is that the next frontier in transcatheter aortic valve replacement? So we have uh, just kick-started uh, with Marty Leon, Philippe Genereux, and Raj Makar and myself the new trial that is coming, that is started now, and it's called the PROGRESS study. And the PROGRESS study is a large um, trial where we compare um, patients with moderate aortic stenosis. Half of them will get a transcatheter heart valve and the other half of them will not get it. So we're comparing transcatheter aortic valve replacement versus normal treatment, nothing in moderate aortic stenosis. You ask yourself, yeah, why moderate aortic stenosis? Because what we see is that the outcomes of course in all the uh, partner trials are good. But what we also learn is if we look at these ventricles, there is already a lot of um, fibrosis in these ventricles. And if you do the transcatheter heart valve, the function usually doesn't get better and sometimes get worse. Of course, the success story is there, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, if we are earlier intervening in the disease, we are probably looking at a better outcome in the future. Uh, these are my disclosures. So moderate AS is associated with impaired survival compared to a matched con patient cohort without moderate AS and preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. We did a study this one here in Jack in 2017, where we looked at patients with systolic dysfunction and moderate ARs. So both of them have already an elevated um, event rate. So this is moderate AS, LV dysfunction, mortality. You see here, this is what the normal patients would live like. And this is what happens. In this case, Preserved EF, what we look at first, this is the expected survival and this is the observed survival. So that is significantly less. And the mean aortic valve area was in the range of one to 1.5 centimeters. So we look at that match population to assess the expected survival. So this is what we see and this is what we get. So patients with moderate AS, in this case still preserved ejection fraction, but I'm also gonna show you reduced ejection fraction are associated with worse outcome. Now your question is gonna be moderate aortic stenosis. What is the prevalence of that? So we have this big database coming from Australia that was published in Jack in 2019. This is 240,000 individuals, 18 years and older. And this is 25,000 of them having any grade of aortic stenosis. So 10% out of this total cohort. One-year mortality, five-year mortality, all events, cardiovascular mortality. This is the patients with no aortic stenosis. This is the patients with mild aortic stenosis. This is what we are talking about, moderate aortic stenosis, and this is severe AS. And if we look at that moderate AS, as you can see here, you see that these patients already have a significantly reduced outcome. So we see that here in the curves. These are the patients with basically nothing, less than 10 millimeter mercury, basically no aortic stenosis. These are the patients with mild aortic stenosis, which is already reduced as you compare it to the, to the normals. But the purple ones are the moderate AS 
and the black ones are the severe areas. And you see that over a follow-up of all these years, the outcomes is almost equally bad. It's something that we never realized, but we have very big databases here in Leiden because we digitized our echo lab already in 1990. And since then, all the echoes have been acquired digitally. And so what we've been doing here from that big database, we've been looking in this uh, severe aortic stenosis, moderate aortic stenosis, etc. So this is a study that comes from us that we did together with Singapore that was published in Jack Imaging in 2021. So this is 1300 patients with moderate AS. They are defined as an aortic valve area between one and 1.5. The follow-up, 4.3 years. So we identified them retrospectively and then look at it prospectively. We look for mortality. We look for mortality, stroke, heart failure, and myocardial infarction. It's not just the AS, but what happens actually following the aortic stenosis? Well, it's a different way of thinking because we've always been thinking that it's just a valvular disease, but it's not just a valvular disease because once you develop aortic stenosis, as I said, myocardial damage occurs and it goes gradually. And this has the consequences of aortic stenosis on the left ventricle, on the mitral valve, left atrium, the tricuspid valve, and the right ventricle. And this is the concept that Philippe Genereux published in 2008 in European Heart Journal of staging the aortic stenosis disease. I'm going to show it in pictures. This is the staging in moderate AS. So it starts with an aortic stenosis. What's going to happen is that ventricle is going to dilate to some extent. It's going to develop fibrosis throughout the walls. Once this ventricle starts to dilate, mitral regurgitation starts to come because these leaflets, as we saw in the beginning of the talk, they get a little bit retracted and they start to leak. Then what happens if we develop mitral regurgitation? Left atrial dilatation is going to come. What's going to happen is that atrial fibrillation starts to occur, but also the pressures to the right side will go up. What then happens is that pulmonary hypertension occur and tricuspid regurgitation and eventually right ventricular dilatation. So this all comes together. It starts with the disease on the left, aortic stenosis, and eventually comes with more mortality and morbidity. So we looked at these patients with moderate aortic stenosis. They don't have that much stenosis, but they are suffering. So if you look at all this cohort, stage zero means no cardiac damage. It's just a valvular problem. But 26% of these patients have already some reduction in their LV function. They are in stage one of the disease, like what I just showed you. Stage two, left atrium and or mitral valve damage in another significant part. And finally, this one here, pulmonary vasculature or problems with the tricuspid valve. And finally, even some are heading towards right ventricular damage. So now if we take a look at this cohort that I showed you in the beginning, what does the mortality look like? And this is long-term, eh? this is five years, but five years doing nothing. Stage zero is doing reasonably well. That remained just that moderate aortic stenosis and nothing happened. But if we look at stage one, we see that that goes already up to 35, 36%. And if we look then stage two, they're almost the same. But once they go in stage three and four, once the disease spreads to the other components of the heart, you see that the mortality goes up. And if we take the combined endpoints, then we see here stage one, stage zero, which is the reference, stage one and two, stage three, and stage four. It gets worse and worse and worse. So we create this concept here, extra aortic valvular cardiac damage staging. Stage one, no damage. Stage, stage zero, no damage. Stage one, it becomes a ventricular disease. Stage two, 
it becomes left atrial mitral damage. Stage three, pulmonary vasculature, means pulmonary pressures going up, and or tricuspid regurgitation. Stage four, the right ventricle fails. So parallel to a moderate aortic stenosis, if you don't do anything, the stenosis get probably more severe, but it's not only that, you get this additional damage and it spreads from the aortic valve to the ventricle, starts to dilate. Mitral regurgitation comes, the atrium is suffering, starts to dilate, atrial fibrillation comes. What happens is that the pressures on the right side start to go up. Once the pressures go up, the RV starts to dilate, tricuspid regurgitation comes, and eventually what happens is that your RV dilates significantly and the function goes down. And that is what explains in these patients that if you wait way too long with them, yes, your moderate aortic stenosis will get worse, but it's spreading very rapidly from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. And eventually that is what is associated with these bad outcomes. So what we know now about moderate AS is that it's a frequently happening disease. Oh, I need to, this is sort of the saving of the lights when you're not working in the hospital. If I don't move, then the light goes out. So what we've learned here is that moderate AS is frequent. The event rate is high, the mortality is high. And that's where the question came from, should we go for an earlier intervention? And that's the trial that we're gonna do now. So I've gone full circle. I touched upon the mitral valve, mitral regurgitation, speaking about valvular disease versus ventricular disease. Then we went to the aortic stenosis. We look a little bit that moderate aortic stenosis is important because the outcomes are not good, but eventually the outcomes become very bad. And that's not because the moderate aortic stenosis stays, probably it becomes more severe aortic stenosis, but with it is not only a valvular problem, but it becomes a ventricular problem. It becomes a left atrial problem. It becomes a right ventricular problem with tricuspid regurgitation. Of course, that's the worst case scenario and a lot of patients don't get there. But when we start to operate on more severe aortic stenosis or we do a transcatheter heart valve, all that additional damage is there. And if we look very carefully, what happens to the rest of the heart once we have done, let's say a surgical a replacement or a transcatheter replacement, if you follow them up longer, you will see that the parts of the damage are visible. So what I have tried to give you is that we should think in a different way. A valvular disease quite easily becomes a ventricular disease. That happens in mitral regurgitation, that happens in aortic stenosis. This is my last slide. I hope it was a little bit useful for you and I thank you for your kind attention. Fernando. Hi, Jerome. How are you? It's Hector. It's a pleasure to hey, see Hector. you. Hey, Hector. Was this a little bit okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, we loved it. I loved it. That's and why actually, I wanted to, collab... to, to bring in these two diseases, you know, not to talk about mitroclip or something, but to give you this concept, which I really believe in, is that you cannot isolate it, say, okay, I got a valve disease and I'm going to fix that and everything's going to be okay or I just have a small valve disease and I'm gonna wait for a longer time and things will be at some moment ready for surgery. I think if we start thinking this way in a different way, yeah, then you see that it's happening. And that, that I think is, is what we have learned from this, what I learned from this. That's why we look at these big databases that we have and we, we can identify them prospectively in this big database. Then we can retrospectively go back to them, analyze them, and then I see the things happening. So that's why this new trial is now on the moderate AS and is, is really focusing on that. I think the first two, three patients have been included and um, it's, it's gonna be a difficult trial of course, but I think look at all the things we do. If you watch your car, if you wait too long with all the damage, then you can throw it away. But if you go in and you repair or get it repaired earlier, then probably it won't last, it, it will last longer. So that's the concept that I'm thinking. And this concept about intervening earlier, 
is not only for mitral regurg or aortic stenosis, but also in atrial fibrillation. If we come quite late and the atrium is dilated and there's a lot of fibrosis in this atrium, you can ablate what you want to, but you're not gonna take away the atrial fibrillation. Also thinking in this different concept, like this whole heart concept, we published that in the Lancet, uh, I think two years ago or so, is a different way of thinking. So that's why I, I wanted to give that to you and just look slightly different at valvular heart disease as compared to the whole heart disease. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bax. Excuse me, because I have a problem with my audio, but I'm coming Don't back. worry, and my first name is Jeroen, okay? <laughs> okay, Jeroen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for this excellent presentation. It was more than we expected and we and was fascinating. Uh, we will continue with the question and answer questions um, and session, the session. And uh, I have some questions and some others from the audience. So if sure. you are ready, uh, I'm going to start with some question about the mitral regurgitation. Um, the first one is that in patients with mitral regurgitation that are candidates for mitral clip, how do the pulmonary hypertension, tricuspid regurgitation, and right ventricular dysfunction uh, affect the use of mitral clip? How we work with it? If we use it as contraindications, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. Maybe if it's a contraindication or you need to take, a, take account of this type of, of, of pathologies to decide yeah. uh, the use of yeah. microclip. Well, I think if you, if you follow the, the thinking, what we did at, <clears throat> at the end with this aortic stenosis, if you apply the same to the mitral, right? Then we, we, we start with a mitral regurgitation and um, there becomes more, volume going round, so your ventricle starts to dilate and um, you get the bad effects on the left atrium and then it spreads to the right. We have looked at that also and you see almost in every sort of disease, not only mitral regurgitation uh, and aortic stenosis, but the same with tricuspid regurgitation. If you look at those patients, as soon as this right ventricle gets a bad function, um, the outcomes are significantly worse. We can treat it symptomatically, but it's hard to prolong the outcomes in a good way. Um, what we have done is that we try to see how we could identify that better. We published that in, I think, in Jack Heart Failure about a year ago, following this concept that we just showed you. And uh, we saw that it's hard to measure the function in the right ventricle. You know, you got the TAPSI and all these things and the fractional area change. But what I believe very much in, and that's what we showed in this article, that if you use the free wall strain with echo, it's rather simple to do, and it's a very good predictor. So if this strain of the right ventricle is bad, then the outcome of whatever patient is usually not very good. So RV is one of the most important drivers of bad outcomes in the patients. Um, we've also looked at patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Of course, you got several tricuspid regurgitations. It can be a right atrial problem as we start to realize now more and more that an atrial fibrillation, big atria. I didn't show that today, but that's also uh, becoming more to our attention. But if you look at the vast majority of tricuspid regurgitations, that's just problems with the right ventricle. And so as soon as you see that the ventricle is bad, we can treat it, we can clip it, we do it also, but that's a symptomatic treatment. You're not gonna prolong the life too much. Now that brings us to a very important question. If you ask to a heart failure patient, what is more important for you? Living longer or living maybe the same, uh, but with less symptoms? They will also say, I prefer less symptoms. So that brings us in a very interesting discussion because we are always used to whatever trial is being shown at the, at the ESC or the American Heart or the American College. Every trial they show is always looking at the um, outcomes in terms of mortality. But for patients that are living with heart failure related to severe valve disease, these patients think more symptomatic. If we can relieve the symptoms for them, we improve the quality of life. And for them, that's most important. So my answer to you is, yeah, if the right ventricle is bad, it's a bad sign. If you have severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation is most often related to left-sided heart disease. 
that also comes from all these registries that people published. So that is, that is something. But I think what is important is that on the one hand, intervening earlier, that's in the hope of preventing or stopping cardiac disease, the staging what I showed. On the other hand, if patients are very far in the staging, they can still benefit from something. And that's the symptomatic treatment. And if you have severe tricuspid regurgitation, you need to take a lot of antidiuretics uh, and a lot of diuretics each, every day to lose the edema, et cetera. Um, the quality of life is not very good. So symptomatic treatment and treatment for living longer. Treatment for living longer means earlier intervention. But helping people that are already there and you can help their symptoms improve, that's also very, very important. So I hope that answers a little bit your question. That was perfect. Uh, I have a question from the, from the chief of the collab here, Dr. Gabriel Salazar. He talked about the uh, effective regurgitation orifice and the volume, volume regurgitation. Yeah. And he said that could be that this, this method is too blind to take the decisions in a, in, in, in a mitre, functional mitral regurgitation. So what do you think about to take only these two parameters to take the decisions in these type of patients? I fully agree with him. And uh, I think it's a very good observation. And that uh, part that I try to bring that we should not watch these two in isolation. It's these two that give you part of the story. And then the other part of the story is, of course, when you talk about secondary MR, is the LV function. If the LV function is really poor, then that is driving the outcomes. The problem is it would be so nice if we would have sort of cutoff numbers that we could use. We say, well, if the LVEF is this or better the LV dimensions or the LV volume is that and the effective regurgent orifice area uh, or the regurgent volumes and or the regurgent volumes are so and so, so relatively good, uh, relatively not so much regurgitation, relatively more regurgitation and less ventricular disease. That's the concept, but the concept, the problem is that it, that we, we cannot find the right cutoff. <clears throat> and sometimes you see patients that you think, ah, oh, this is really not gonna work. And they still do a fairly good outcome. That's the question that I, I, I don't completely understand. Probably that is related to the right-sided heart disease, what I'm thinking. That the right side, if that is already more affected than we thought, then that's probably gonna put the patients in problems. But the question is very legitimate. And I would say there are different components, ventricular disease, valvular disease. What are the balances of these two? Is it more of a ventricular disease? Well, then your clip is not gonna bring you so much. If it's more of a, of a valve disease, your clip is gonna do a lot of good. But then again, you got that right side there. And if you do a lot of clipping and you take away completely, but the right side is already affected and is bad, then that's gonna have a negative impact. So I think my message is not is that what I'm gonna tell you, you should do this one or that one. I'm only saying that if you discuss them in your heart team, because that's what we do eh, nowadays, then um, it's good to take a look at the left ventricular function, the size, the severity of the MR, but also take a look at that right side of the heart and then try to take the right decisions. And even then, sometimes patients live unexpectedly much longer when you treat them with the clip than what you could ever predict. So I think it's a very hard one to say which one needs and doesn't, or which one is benefiting from one and which one is not benefiting from one. So it's a hard discussion, but at least what, what I try to do is try to, to some extent, understand a little bit better why we see things happening as they do. I hope that that answers the question a little bit. I hope to, to Dr. Salazar. And I have a, a question from my, my chef and, and my colleague and my friend, uh, Dr. Jaime Carales. Uh, he asked about the use of mitral clip uh, to use like a bridge to cardiac transplantation. If it's a possibility, a real possibility in the patients with not only severe mitral regurgitation, 
on also the moderate mitral regurgitation with compromise of the pulmonary vasculature. What do you think about it, Dr. Bax? Yeah, I think it's it's a good point. Yeah, it's a good point that we can use it as bridging. And uh, it's probably something that we're going to look at more and more. Um, something to totally different is, um, you know, transplantation. But we're also thinking a little bit more here. We do a lot of these LVAT uh, approaches. Um, and there's also discussing bridging, but most of it is destination. And um, then I have a good friend that I didn't see for a long time, and uh, his name is Pete Janssen. And Pete Janssen is uh, the one that works with this company, which has developed this uh, total artificial heart, which you bring in. Have you seen that one? They've done about 30 at the moment, and um, it's it seems to work really well. So if you talk about severe damage, uh, what are the perspectives? Uh, bridging too, yes, absolutely. Unloading the heart, making the heart, giving time to some recovery, and then in a better situation, doing something. Also, assist devices, but also, um, you know, doing that thing what we just talked about, um, about this 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 total heart uh, therapy. So I think that is that is also um, something that's certainly coming. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I have a question in, in the topic of moderate aortic stenosis that yep. uh, is, is about, uh, it's about the, your last, based on your research on moderate aortic stenosis, do you think mm -hmm. other factors like, uh, for example, a strain or valvular aortic impedance could be used to indicate uh, early aortic valve replacement? in the cases like in the stage zero or stage one in, in moderate aortic stenosis? Um, say that again, one more time. Yes, based on your research, do you think that, uh, that other factors like uh, strain or valvular aortic impedance uh, could be used to indicate an early aortic valve replacement in patients that have an, a moderate aortic stenosis that are in the stage zero or one uh, classified by, by your research? I think so, yeah, I think so. I was just looking here at the phone while you were speaking um, because I, I couldn't find the name anymore, but um, this is what, what they have. You should look it up one time. Let me see, it's called Karmat, the company. And it's very impressive what they do. So I, I, I perhaps you take a look and you see what they do on this total heart. But to come back to the question, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I have a question from Dr. Medina. He said, uh, what do you think about including the late gadolinium enhancement burden on the Cox survival as a viable confounder in mod moderate aortic stenosis may have changed the hazard radio? Um, we, we have not done this. So I don't have big series with late gadolinium enhancement in moderate aortic stenosis so that they can talk about the ventricle. But just to come back at that previous question, um, I always say when I do these sort of lectures about the MRI and echo and whatever, you have anatomical markers of the disease. And that's basically what MRI gives us. It gives us the delayed enhancement, which is big scar. But also we can do the T1 mapping, which I mentioned briefly, which gives us the diffuse fibrosis. You don't see it, but you can measure it because the T1 um, is prolonged. And the longer the T1 uh, is, the more fibrosis there is in your ventricle. And that is the anatomical picture. Okay, but most of us, we don't do T1 mapping on a routine basis. And we also don't do a lot of routine in, in, in clinical management of aortic stenosis patients. We don't do a lot of MRI, so the delayed enhancements we also don't have. But what is the functional component of the anatomical fibrosis or scar? The functional reflecting of that is there, that your strain goes down, your function goes down. So the more fibrosis you have, the more delayed enhancement you get, the worse and worse and worse your strain becomes. 
So just to come back to that previous question is that anatomically would be ideal to see it, but most of the times we don't have that, but strain is a very good surrogate of how good or how bad that ventricle is. And that is also the other question that you ask, how important is this for prognosis? How important is the ventricle? So I always say it starts with a valvular disease, but it becomes a ventricular disease if you wait long enough. And we saw that with the uh, mitral valve. So it starts with the leaking valve and then it spreads and it becomes a ventricular disease. With the aortic stenosis, it's the same. If you have the door closed, then eventually that ventricle is gonna dilate. First, it starts to dysfunction, fibrosis, hypertrophy comes, and then it dilates. And then the end stage, of course, is what we see is dilated cardiomyopathy. So I think the interaction between the anatomy and the functional consequences is very important. And the anatomy measuring for us with the MRI, we cannot do that on large scale. But what we can do is in everybody an echo with strain. And you will see it. If you look at these patients, you go back to your, your, uh, the patients that have been with you for a longer time with the aortic stenosis, you see that the strain gradually goes down. We published also oh, it long enough, and we looked retrospective at these databases. You see actually that the strain starts to gradually go down. So reflecting again, that what starts as a valvular disease becomes a ventricular disease. And in a way that's the same with the, with the mitral George, but this is, in the aortic stenosis is really like that. If you wait too long, then you're sure that the ventricle is going to suffer. And it happens already quite early. And that of course, is not reversible because, well, I should not say, of course, nobody really knows, but my, my view is that probably fibrosis is not going to be reversible if you have that in your ventricle. That's very clear, Dr. Portubax. I, I have a question uh, that is, first of all, a question because I, I, I don't want to lose the opportunity to, to ask yeah, yeah, you. Take all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <laughs> but take a look at that karma thing that I, that I told you because I thought it was really visionary what they're doing, that they're just bringing a total artificial heart putting it okay. in the own heart. And it was developed with um, with the group of Carpanche, Carpanche himself, you know, the, the big surgeon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Very you interesting. Can text me in the chat, the, 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 you can text me the, 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 the link. Yeah. Dr. Bax, I have a question because I know you are participated in a, in a, in a trial, uh, the Taber Unload. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that is very interesting because you know that in post-taber, uh, after taber with a low ejection fraction has related to valve thrombosis. And maybe the patient with moderate aortic stenosis could be younger. What do you think yeah. about the durability of taber in these patients and in your trial going to be? Because these patients probably are um, in an earlier stage. So the whole question is going to be when are you going to, which are the right ones that you're going to pick? So maybe that indeed the durability is going to be an issue. But I don't think that's really going to be an issue because what we see now over time is that we start to do, if you look in the beginning, we're only doing the very old and now we shift already to a younger age and we can do one valve and then we can do valve in valve. So that is moving forward very quickly. So I think um, that should not be any obstruction. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Bax. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here. I'm very lucky to moderate this session with you because you're like a rock star in the cardiology world. No. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, so. If we are in person, I take a photo with you, but uh, right now I need to close this session. So one more time, uh, thank you so much to, for this presentation, it was amazing. And um, no more, I'm going to speak in Spanish right now. So Dr. Bax, if you can stay and, and uh, one, one time uh, to talk with you, to, to close and, and, and maybe to have a, a different uh, type of, of, of relation eh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to close with in Spanish. Muchas gracias Dr. Bax por acompañarnos, eh, gracias a todos eh, los participantes por su asistencia y hasta una próxima oportunidad esperamos que haya sido um, eh, de su agrado esta, estas charlas. Muchas gracias.